All right. Welcome to Computer Science E75. This is Lecture 9, Scalability. Um, next week, we will likely be joined by a guest lecturer, David Heitmeyer, who teaches one of uh, two of the other web-oriented development courses at the school. Specifically, he's going to be giving a guest lecture on advanced CSS, so one of the themes that's come up in the uh, surveys of late, which even though they're not due quite yet, we've been keeping an eye on, has been that we went pretty quickly over CSS at the beginning of the term. So we thought we have a perfect opportunity here to have an expert come in and talk about some more sophisticated CSS techniques, certainly than the ones we spent terribly brief time on early on in the semester. So that'll be uh, replacing the to be announced description in the course's syllabus for next week. So tonight is about scalability. And while I've tried to emphasize the applicability of this idea or this problem to the course's content, LAMP specifically, AJAX and the like, I think you'll find that a lot of tonight's topics sort of go beyond the scope of the course in a good way, insofar as they're applicable to uh, servers that aren't, my, uh, that aren't Apache, to languages that aren't PHP, and so forth. Um, sort of timely that there's a, another conference related to the course going on today onward out in San Francisco, probably, or uh, out in California, probably a little too late to make it, but you might want to at least check out what slides and whatnot might be posted on uh, MySQL's website at that particular URL, clearly sponsored in some form by O'Reilly. All right, so for tonight, um, these are some really good, really interesting books that relate to the following problem. How do you scale a dynamic website? So we thus far have had the luxury, certainly, of assuming a user base of one person, your teaching fellow, two people. Maybe if you had some friends and family banging on your sites, maybe a dozen or so maximally. But some really interesting, if not hard, problems arise when you have to consider not a user base of 10 or 100 or even maybe 500 or 1,000, but tens of thousands or, God forbid, even more than that. And all of a sudden, it's not sufficient to assume that CS75.net or your own installation of XAMPP can get the job done. Because in short, if you have ever more uh, numbers of hits per second, something at some point is probably going to break. And consider even your own projects. We now have potential bottlenecks in the form of the database itself, in the form of the web server itself, in the form of the PHP processor itself, maybe even in the browser if you're trying to do something fairly Ajax heavy. And that, in turn, has to hit the web server again and again and again, especially for content that's being dynamically updated. So here's some interesting readings. Um, if you've liked our use of MySQL in the course and sort of can imagine yourself deploying it in your own work environment, maybe my favorite book um, on the list is the second one, High Performance MySQL. And an update to that is scheduled for this coming summer. Because in fact, I believe the, one of the plans for tomorrow's keynote at the foregoing conference is to announce the official release of MySQL 5.1, which has sort of been around in some form for a while. But Sun Microsystems, which bought MySQL some time ago, um, is finally, I think, releasing the, uh, the release version of 5.1, which has a number of features, many of which we've not even touched on in this course since they're more germane to larger websites. But tonight, we begin to glance there. Is there a hand about to go up somewhere? No? All right. So um, this was the only picture I could come up with to convey the idea of vertical scaling. So when it comes to scalability, this is all about handling larger loads. What do we mean by loads? More queries per second, more web page requests per second, more of everything per second. And one, two of the perhaps most obvious approaches you can take toward dealing with an increasing user base and an increased load on your server is what's generally known as vertical scaling or horizontal scaling. And vertical scaling, is this is the best picture I could come up with, uh, late at night, at least, um, is all about throwing money at the problem, typically. He's throwing the biggest server possible, more RAM, more CPU, more money, more cycles, so that you can still design and maintain your current design in sort of a single computer model, like we've been doing throughout the course with CS75.net in one instance of MySQL, one instance of Apache, maybe spawning multiple threads or processes. But everything's sort of nice and clean and is identical in design to what you might deploy for just one or 10 users. Right? It's sort of a very compelling solution because if you can just throw money and cycles and RAM at the problem, we well, don't have to change anything. Dare say you don't have to think any harder. What's perhaps the downside of this approach? This was a really funny episode. This was with Tony the Mimbo, if you recall. So, What's the downside of this approach? <laughs> 
Right, so you have to throw money at the problem, and most of you know that you know it's diminishing returns at the higher end of the performance spectrum. Paying, you'll pay more dollars to go from three gigahertz to three point one six gigahertz, for instance, than you might from going from two point eight seven to three point zero. So the, the you have diminishing returns of performance given the amount of dollars you're throwing out the problem. Um, plus. What's another sort of fundamental problem about this approach of vertical scaling? Just bigger, bigger, bigger. A well, single point of failure, certainly, if you're assuming a single computer model. And that's something we'll soon address. So that's certainly true. Right, so there's kind of an upper bound, right? I think the fastest Xeon processor on the market right now from Intel is, I think, 3.16 gigahertz. So if that's not enough for your computational needs, you kind of have to start thinking harder about the problem. So you'll reach these upper limits. So horizontal scaling, which is often touted as the better solution, certainly the more robust, long-term, sort of careful uh, solution, is all about throwing not more money at one point in your infrastructure, but having redundancy, having multiple machines, maybe even multiple cheaper machines, maybe each with less RAM and fewer CPU cycles and so forth, but spreading them out so that you really have a, a distributed network, or you at least have a, a cluster of systems, any one of whom can be queried for information and thus respond to the user with, say, the web page that they desire. But unfortunately, it's not as simple as just throwing more machines at the problem and connecting them all to a switch and installing your software on all of them because there's implications of moving your software from one system to multiple systems, uh, particularly when it comes to a database. Right? If you can sort of imagine, even if you're just kind of thinking ahead here, if all of a sudden I have multiple web servers running my code, but I have multiple MySQL databases on all of them, and maybe the user's randomly assigned to one of these web servers upon making a web page request, I kind of have to make sure they see the same database again and again. And that just sort of hints at the thought that now has to go into the design of your overall application or your overall architecture. Well, what if vertical scaling is where you want to focus? Well, what are the axes along which you can vertically scale? Well, in terms of CPUs these days, you have unicore, dual core, quad core systems, and even uh, eight or more coming down the pipeline. L2 cache, right? More of that tends to be good, but there too you'll have an upper bound on what's actually available on the market. Disk, you can at least throw the best disks at the problem so that if your web site or your application is beginning to slow down, well, maybe that's because it's going to disk a lot. Well, the least you can do, perhaps, is just throw faster disks at it. So you have parallel ATA, aka IDE, you have serial ATA, you have serial attached SCSI, and these are sort of in order not only of uh, chronology, but also kind of sort of in terms of price. These, for instance, are, tend to be 15,000 revolutions per minute. These tend to be about half that. So there you already have sort of an immediate appeal, but there's a cost to, say, SAS over SATA, which is very specifically the money. You're going to spend more for it, and the disks tend to be smaller. Um, there's RAID, and we can sort of, you could spend, you know, certainly an entire lecture on these kinds of things. So if you're not so familiar with these terms, I'm sure Google and Wikipedia can be your friends, but if you're generally familiar with hardware, you can certainly vertical scale by just getting the better version of some solution, the faster disks. You can get the faster CPUs, you can throw more RAM at the problem. But there will come a point where things just get very expensive because you are paying for only marginal improvement in performance, or you just can't fit more than, say, 16 gigs of RAM into the box that you own, or so forth. So, what's horizontal scaling? So, Google Images kind of failed me here. Uh, this is from Wikipedia's Wikimedia site, which is apparently, at one point in time, maybe a couple of years ago, the rack of servers that ran Wikimedia, which I think is the bank of servers that has all of their images that are on Wikipedia's pages. It's actually not all that impressive. I really wanted a nice photograph of a data center with lots of machines, but I, there was sort of a trade-off between more and more minutes on Google Images and the value of showing you a picture with lots of computers. So, uh, extrapolate, if you could, to a data center containing many of these systems. Systems. And the point is that horizontal scaling is more about maybe going with commodity hardware, just cheaper, even generic hardware, not necessarily Sun hardware or IBM or Dell, but rather super micro or something that you might even put together yourself so long as you have redundancy to mitigate the support concerns that might otherwise arise, but throwing more hardware at the problem and thinking more carefully about the design. And perhaps this isn't something 
That's the domain of a typical developer, but it's sort of the fun problem, I think, when trying to decide how to support hundreds or thousands of users. No longer can you just assume that your PHP skills will sort of get the problem done. You have to take a step back and consider how you're connecting everything together and what you're running it on. So what can you do? What's some of the low-hanging fruit, at least, that even you and a single a uh, single server environment, maybe at your current workplace or in your own organization, what can you do that's pretty easy to improve performance? Well, hmm? write better code. OK, so you can definitely write better code, right? You, yeah, big O of N is better than big O of N squared. And so you can go through your own code and such. Um, what is perhaps even easier? Right? It's sort of easier if you can just install something and your same code gets faster. So I'll focus on that tonight. And we'll spend the rest of the semester focusing on code correctness and design. So PHP is an interpreted language, which generally speaking means what? OK, good. That's sort of, uh, yeah, that gets us right to the end game. Uh, so it's slow. Why is it to slow? So it needs to be translated. It's not compiled, right? Never once in this course have you run GCC or the equivalent and taken your source code and outputted a .exe or equivalent. Rather, you just uploaded a file to a server and let the web server figure out how to interpret what's sort of pseudo-English into machine opcodes, zeros and ones, add, subtracts, multiply, and so forth. Well, the catch with PHP, at least in most deployments, is that because you're never compiling it and installing the binary form, so to speak, but rather just uploading the source code, every damn request for that file means that that PHP file is going to get compiled effectively on the fly into zeros and ones. Sort of a simplification, but that's the idea. The next time someone requests that same file, even if nothing has changed, you've forgotten about that file altogether, what happens the next time? So the same thing. It gets recompiled again because those byte codes, the zeros and ones, so to speak, are just living in RAM, being executed by the CPU, and then that's it. Well, here's an obvious opportunity for some optimization. Why don't we cache the opcodes? Why don't we cache the compiled form, Not ideally without putting more of a burden on you, the developer, because it is kind of nice not having to run a compiler and then keep track of the binary and source. But why don't we let the web server or our architecture take care of that for us? So there exist a number of tools that can not only optimize your code, which actually has questionable benefits depending on the, side and the size and complexity of the code, but you can at least cache the opcodes typically by just adding a module to your web server, adding a software that other folks have written whose purpose in life is to recognize when a script gets compiled, then cache those opcodes somewhere, and then the next time someone requests that same file, just execute those same opcodes as opposed to recompiling. And some of the most popular ones for PHP are these. So you have APC, eAccelerator, Xcache, and then Zen Platform. Most of these are freely available. And though they sometimes require some tinkering with php.ini files, depending on your architecture, you might have to compile some stuff. At the end of the day, once you have things installed, and frankly, so many people are using these kinds of packages that you can pretty much copy paste other people's handiwork and configuration files into your own, once you've turned this on, you can just sit back and trust that you're going to overall, at least for a, high perform uh, at least for a, a highly demanded website, you're going to get improvement because your CPU is going to spend less time compiling stuff again and again and therefore have more time just to service requests. So in theory, you can handle more requests per second just by turning something like this on. And I'll defer to um, your own uh, research as to what might make sense for your particular platform, but uh, all of these are um, quite popularly in use these days. Yeah. So an opcode, uh, it, think of it as a bytecode in Java or um, um, object code in C or C++. It's the, zero, it's the machine code representation that's generated as a result of a program, a compiler, taking your source code and converting it into something the machine can understand. So zeros and ones, in short. Yeah? For most of these accelerators, it's a one-pass compilation. Um, but this is why I note that some of these, and I forget which offhand, also offers code optimization, where it will actually analyze your code and uh, optimize it using various compiler heuristics. Unrolling loops, for instance, if you're familiar with the concept, um, and generally changing 
the underlying implementation of the ideas you implemented in source code. Um, I think, though, that you'll find, at least in reading up on this, that PHP files, for the most part, do tend to be small, at least smaller than a lot of programs. And so there's this trade-off between the amount of time your, your processor is spending optimizing the code versus actually executing the code. So there you get there are higher returns, typically, from just caching the results and worrying less about fairly low-level optimizations of the code. Yeah. You're seeing that optimization would give you the, the most return in combination with caching. Sure, and I think at least one of these guys offers both of those in conjunction, but most of these packages tend to just um, do caching, as far as I know. All right. All right. So now, so that's sort of the lowest hanging fruit when it comes to PHP. You've got a PHP web server, or you've got a web server with PHP enabled via, say, Apache or some other web server, even IIS. Installing one of those packages can simply um, save you some time. I would take with a grain of salt some of the claims made in the documentation. I mean, some of these guys claim, and it's quite the range, improvement, speed improvement of two to 100 times just by caching the opcodes. And maybe that's true, but you have to take into account context there and how big the files and how many requests you're getting per second. But it's probably fair to say that at least for a well-trafficked site, you will get some improvement, really at no cost to you, other than the perhaps headache of getting things set up. So what if vertical scaling and these off-the-shelf solutions really aren't getting the job done? Because your website, because of your own uh, you're a victim of your own success and the thing is so increasingly popular or the kinds of computational tasks that your code is doing is so intensive that on one machine you can only handle so many users per second. Well, what can you do to handle more transactions per second? All right, so let's now look more at the, the network level. So let's take a step back from all things PHP and software and think more at the network level. Well, one of the things that almost every big website probably every big website today does, is have not just one web server, but multiple web servers. So if that's the case, if we were to have CS751.net, 2.net, 3.net, what are, some of the, what are the, some of the implications of that? Or what are some of the problems that make it, um, what do we need to take into account if we want to have three different web servers all running the same software? Well, each one has to be self-sufficient. You have to, have to get the same results. So Good. They have, to be, they, have to have, they have to have the whole storage system available. Okay, good. So they all have to provide the same view of the world to summarize. If I hit this box, I better get the same results as I would if I went to this box. Well, how do I get to this box versus this box? Well, back in the day, if we think back to a lot of phone advertisements, companies that have multiple phone numbers, like a food takeout place, you'll often see on menus, even today, maybe even Three Aces had two phone numbers maybe on its menu. Well, this was sort of an interesting load balancing solution back in the day when you couldn't tie phone lines together. Well, if one line tends to be busy, the obvious solution is just to get a second phone line. Unfortunately, you put the burden on the customer, because now I have to try this number, and then if it's busy, I have to remember what the other number is, and I have to try that. All right, so fortunately, we've not devolved on the web into that kind of approach. Right? You can imagine going to, you've got to try www.yahoo.com, but if that times out, try www.yahoo.com. Right? We have computers for a reason. So there exist these solutions known as load balancers, whereby if a request comes in, you being the user, into this cloud known as the internet, ideally we'd like to have someone sitting in between the user and your multiple web servers sort of deciding, using some heuristic, which web server a given user should go to. Uh, layer four in this case would be, um, uh, actually we could talk about it, layer three. Yeah, um, well, it doesn't matter at this layer. Three and four, I believe, are the same in OSI and TCP IP. Yay, name? Right, four is transport, three is network, but I think that's the same in both OSI and TCP IP. No? What's the difference in seven? Uh, so that's true, but those are up higher. That's five, six, seven. Right, correct. But everything below is the same. Right, right. But in this case, what, what layer are we talking about when you say layer 4? So layer 4 in this case is at the TCP level, or more generally TCP IP level. A lot of the load balancers will actually look at two different ones. And actually, um, 
it's useful, yes. So layer three, layer four, TCP IP at that level is um, the end game here. So you, thinking back, even as far back as lecture zero, when we introduced CS75.net and the panel, uh, and one acronym I'll hold off on actually stating, how can you implement this idea using just some of the simple technologies we've used in the course? Yeah, so DNS. We already have, for this course's purposes, and on the internet in general, this layer of indirection that exists between users and endpoints, between A and B. Right. The first thing your computer does when you try to pull up yahoo.com is ask some nearby DNS server, either at Harvard or AT&T, or maybe of one of the root servers, depending on uh, when that uh, question was last asked. I'm asking the world, what is the IP address of yahoo.com? I get back an answer, and then my laptop goes and contacts that IP address specifically. So it would seem, using some existing mechanisms, we could just take what is our DNS server, and for the first time someone asks for www.cs75.net, well maybe we can just have the DNS server return the IP address 1.2.3.4. But the next time someone requests cs75.net, we can have them return, the DNS server return 1.2.3.5. And the next time, 1.2.3.6. The implication being, this is uh, dot one, this is dot two, oh wait, no, this is dot four, this is dot five, and this is dot six. In other words, if we give each of our web servers, which hardware-wise, software-wise, might otherwise be identical copies of one another, at least different IP addresses, and put them behind a device whose design is to provide this layer of abstraction between the actual hardware and the user, we can just tell the user to go this direction, or this direction, or that direction, all simply by changing our DNS configuration. So you'll recall this, and you haven't had to edit these files manually. We have this nice panel, but at the end of the day, it's just simplifying um, the editing of a text file. This is sort of, these are four entries from Bind, the uh, name server uh, software that we're using and many websites use. It turns out that even though thus far, most of you have been defining uh, I think effectively C name entries by way of the panel. If you defined an A record for www, you would typically say something like this and give it an IP address. But if you want www to resolve to multiple IP addresses using bind, very popular DNS software, just insert multiple A records for the same host name, pointing to different IP addresses. And by default, what bind, the DNS server we're using, will do is return an answer um, in round robin format by default. The very first time someone asks cs75.net for the uh, IP of www, it will answer .131. The next time, .132, .133, .134, .131. And that process will just continue ad nauseum until the requests stop altogether. So what's, a, what's nice about this approach? What's good? What's appealing about it? Yeah. It's really simple, right? We've got all the tools. Editing this file or using the panel to do this, really not all that hard. I'm going to have to, granted, configure each of my servers with a unique IP. And I can do that with DHCP, or I can just hard code it, whether these are Linux boxes or Windows boxes. It's pretty simple. Any other things that are compelling, that are good about this? It's pretty commonly done. Yeah. Good. I mean, there's no new additions to the architecture. We're just you, you making bet, even better use, perhaps, of the architecture already in place. All right. Now it's easier to tear things down. What's bad about this? You yeah. can't take advantage oh. of anything special that you might know or be able to deduce. True. So now you have this, because this is at layer three or layer four, you have this disconnect between your application, which is at layer five and above in this model, and the actual load balancing. That is to say, even if David is a really a much heavier user of dub 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 dot whatever than is Joe, well, each of us is going to get assigned, you know, effectively to a random box over time. Well, the problem is if a lot of Davids get assigned to the same box, that machine itself might slow to a crawl. So there's no intelligence whatsoever as to where people are getting sent. Other potential gotchas. Mm. You so to summarize, if there's a problem, perhaps if someone's logged into your software, logged into your box, because why? What does it mean to be logged into a box? 
you've got a session and thus far we know that sessions are stored typically as flat files, as text files on the server, often in the slash temp directory, which means on this guy's slash temp directory. So let's come back to that. That's a really good point that has a non-obvious solution, if imperfect solutions. Um, so that's another perhaps gotcha here. What? Yeah. Doesn't bind no to? So yes and no. So and this actually leads to another point. Let me hold that thought and see if we can get to the same answer by other comments as well. But I'll come back to that. Assuming if you had a cookie that's holding your session very variable, would your computer still also have the DNS cat to go to the same ID? So yes and no. And this sort of raises a bigger picture. So in theory, everything between here and there, the user typically caches the DNS responses such that if another request comes through proximal in time, if my, you, my laptop even bothers to ask the world, what is the IP address for www again, I should typically get back the same response from one of the intermediate DNS servers between me and the load balancer. And Windows and Linux and Mac OS maintain their own caches so that they don't have to constantly ask the DNS server. So in short, we sort of have a built-in mechanism that redresses this problem, but it's not fully robust because we'll pick harder in a second. Once you get past that box with www1 inside it, you have no control over those caches. You have no control over well, true, true. firewall or proxy or the user's Windows machine feels the need to refresh its cache. True. So with high, I think it's fair to say with decent, if not high, probability, that will work, but it's not robust. I mean, it's not a safe assumption, certainly for a website you care about the deterministic behavior of. Yeah. Well, certainly if there's any back end database, you have to worry about transactions locked. Yeah, so now we have this problem too. Single. Right, if we have a database, if this is CS75 finance, where you kind of need to centralize everything, at least conceptually, so that one, it doesn't matter which server someone gets to, they see their same portfolio. So I don't have three different portfolios just because you have three different web servers. There's also a problem with. Or you also have greater contention, potentially, for that database. So the simple solution, if you need to have shared information across each of these servers in terms of MySQL, might be to do what? Oh, have a shared database server that's maybe here that all of these guys connect to. So thus far, most of you have been writing code that calls MySQL connect to localhost. Well, that's fine when you have just one host. But now we probably want that localhost string to become something like db.cs75.net, an actual external database. But there, I mean, think of it, and we'll, and we'll cross this bridge again in a moment, in a bit. You have three different entry points here, the motivation for which was to balance your load, and yet here you're proposing that the solution to this shared state problem is just to have everything funnel back into one database. And the fact of the matter is the simplest, if not most compelling solution to this problem database-wise is just to spend your money here, for instance. Get the souped up server for the database because it avoids so many complexities potentially, and then just save your money on these boxes and go with the cheapest things you can find, even spare PCs that can just get thrown into rotation. But there too, there will come a point where that link will get saturated or that will break. And plus, you have a single point of failure, which was one of the things to avoid in the first place too. Any other gotchas to using DNS to do our load balancing for us? We've not even touched upon one of the most damning nails. So limited IPs, OK, so that's true. Because you're using DNS, these, and because, the, perp, the, because DNS implies that the user is then going to contact that IP directly, the implication is that the IP needs to be a public IP address. It can't be one of your private 192.168.1. whatever addresses or any of the other uh, classes of, net, of addresses. You got to give each of these machines a public IP address, which one you might not have. Even for CS75, we have four, but we only have four, so we could only scale so far. IPs aren't free, and in this world of IPv4, um, uh, we don't have all that money available to us. Um, plus, there's also some benefits from just using private IPs in the first place for security reasons. You know, it's not the only thing you should do, but having the ability to use private IPs is perhaps damning of this approach. But there's another biggie here. Yeah. 
So URLs might differ. So I was thinking about this today because there are some sites. I think Verizon.com is one of them that for whatever reason they thought it was appropriate to yes, assign their servers these unique, unique host names, but then to expose those unique host names to the world. And what I presume they typically do is like H, maybe, I'm guessing, HTTP redirection, where I pull up Verizon, www.verizon.com, that hits a script or some piece of hardware that decides www.verizon.com is the least congested, let me redirect David there, and then I stay on that box. So there's and you see this on some websites, but this is inelegant why. Let's go down this road, because this is a reasonable um, or this is a reasonable concern. Yeah? Well it completely defeats the purpose if you ever come back, you're gonna go back to the same one you went through last time. Right. Now you you've sort of breached this layer of abstraction. Now when people forward that URL around, maybe when someone slash dots that URL, that URL, that box gets hammered, which sort of defeats the purpose. Other concerns? Well you can add more machines, but if your load goes down, you can't remove any machines. So you can add more machines, but you can't really remove machines. The URL is pointing to that name. Right. So now if, if you want to maintain backwards compatibility, you have to do some annoying URL rewriting, or you just have to break those links if you decide to change your naming scheme. There's a big one here that we're still missing. Oh, about this. Well, I'll take anything, but, but there's a big one. <laughs> DNS isn't terribly secure. In what sense? Um, it is vulnerable to different kinds of attacks. So that's true. So there's these, um, there are DNS related attacks. I'm not sure I would point a finger at that, at least in this context. True, but we're sort of stuck using DNS anyway, at least to get to this point in the story. So I would, let me wave, defer that path for now. Yes, yes. So that's the big one. And no matter the approach we've discussed thus far, if this box goes down, if you've been rewriting URLs, you've completely locked out your users, because what user is going to think upon getting a server not responding, oh, maybe I should remove the one or change it to a two, right? That was what we were trying to avoid in the first place. Or if one of these boxes goes down, and maybe you're not doing URL rewriting, so there's just this layer of indirection, what's how does, hmm, there's this feature of DNS, which generally is useful for scalability, ironically, but is bad for our scalability and our load balancing. How long it, hmm? Right, so I excerpted it from here, but as part of Bind's configuration, you specify a time to live for these DNS responses, which is typically half an hour, an hour, maybe even longer, depending on your design decisions. But the point is that these mappings from host name to IP address exist for some amount of time typically at least an hour or so, because you don't want a server hammering your DNS server again and again and again and again, especially if your IPs aren't going to change. You change them maybe once a year, if even. But machines certainly go down. Well, if this machine goes down and it has the IP address 1.2.3.4, and DNS is still answering people's queries, here's an IP address, absolutely they'll reach a dead end. Well, what's an obvious, perhaps, solution to this? to the, the problem being the DNS server is still telling the world, here's a valid IP, here's a valid IP. What would you do? Quickly give the next one that IP dollars. Ah, good. So we could sort of work our networking skills and just tell one of these guys to start listening for that IP. You can, it's pretty simple in Linux to say, start listening for this IP as well as this IP, especially if you have multiple network cards. Maybe one gotcha there is that, well, now this guy's going to be fielding twice as much traffic. Maybe that's OK for the evening or for the hour till we get the other guy up, but not necessarily a perfect solution. Well, what about here? We could just tweak our DNS server, right? Delete one of these lines from the file so that the DNS server is no longer telling the world to go there, but the cache, right? There are, could be multiple DNS servers between user and DNS server, whether it's Comcast, whether it's Harvard, whether it's your own Macintosh's DNS cache. So people still might be coming in on that IP address. And you might see a fall off over time. Wait an hour, fewer people come in. Wait a day, fewer people. But sort of the rule of thumb on the internet, and you see this even when you make changes at like GoDaddy to your DNS servers, they'll say, 
wait at least a day, uh, two days, 72 hours for the propagation to take effect. And that's just an average because it totally depends on who's between points A and B. But the short of it is that you can't, I mean, you're going to be twiddling your thumbs potentially for a while hoping that the problem resolves itself and it's not necessarily immediately. So in short, what's really compelling, frankly, is the simplicity. This isn't meant to bash the solution all that much, especially if Eh, is it really a big deal if your server goes down for an hour or two and some staff members in your organization can't visit the website? I mean, that actually might be a reasonable trade-off as opposed to your spending money and manpower trying to improve the setup. So this is absolutely compelling given certain assumptions. But can we do better? Well, what if we want to... Um, take into account, as was proposed earlier, some state, some user information, whether it uh, for load balancing purposes. The to catch with DNS, recall, or a catch, is that it's random, or it's round robin, which effectively is random over time, but it doesn't take into account the intensity of users, how much resources, how many resources they need to consume. It doesn't take into account types of transactions, right? You might want to make the website much zippier for people who just want to check out and buy stuff from you. And maybe you're willing to, you know, let the slower users who are just browsing for the day be on some other box. In short, you might want to take into account some application layer information. Well, you can do what's called layer seven. Uh, or layer five load balancing, where you actually take into account information that is related to the application. So this is a this is this itself is a picture from one of the books we recommended earlier. But one of the simplest ways to load balance, perhaps, is based on the user's. Actually, I'm, that, I shouldn't go that way. Uh, based on the users, how about we can take a very simple approach that you see at any conference registration. A through M goes over here, and N through Z goes over here. Right? If you assume a uniform distribution of names over the alphabet, and you want to have just two web servers, well, sort of a very simple, certainly conceptually, solution is have half the alphabet go to this box, have half the alphabet go to this box. And that might be a reasonable solution because an upside of this is you don't need to worry about now about that database problem. right? I can just put a database on this guy, another database on this guy, by partitioning my data. Just keep the data pertinent to certain users on one box, certain data pertinent to other users on another box. And therefore, you're balancing load by only having each box handle 50% of your users. And you don't even have to think about the shared state, the, the database problem, which you might want to avoid because of money, complexity, and so forth. So partitioning is this theme that you can take into account when uh, it comes to scalability so that you can think at the application layer and take into account some state of the world. You can, as this is implying, you can hash on values. right? If every URL contains some tidbit of information, like an ID or even the PHP sesh ID, maybe you can decide based on that which server the user should go to. Because remember, sessions too. This is one of the gotchas. If you have users may logged into your website, well, maybe DNS can't tell that same user with 100% certainty to go back to the same box every time, but you can. If upon a request coming into your load balancer, which for now just consider to be a black box, checks what the user's cookie is. Right? Layer 7 means implies in networking terms that the uh, this device has access to the entire request at all layers. It can look at the HTTP headers, for instance. Well, inside of HTTP headers are things like cookies. Cookie colon was one of the headers we've talked about. So if your box is allowed, albeit at some performance hit, to look inside all the packets and do a, the equivalent of a regular expression match for cookie colon space, and then look for the PHP sesh ID, well, maybe this box can say, oh, you know what? That session belongs on this server because his session file is in slash temp on this server. Oh, this other session cookie is on this server because I saw him there before. And so you can put some state in your load balancer that just remembers where users were. Now that's nice because, again, nothing needs to go down here. All of these boxes can be autonomous with shared nothing, so to speak, the shared nothing state. They don't have anything in common other than the code they're running. Memory and such is completely separate. So that's nice. It's pretty simple. Just means copy your setup again and again and again and put the intelligence here. What's a gotcha of this approach? You run into the same problem as you did with having a single MySQL server. Right. You run into the same problem as you did with one SQL, uh, SQL server, which was what? 
OK, eventually even that is going to choke. Why? So all of your requests are still going through this bottleneck here? Yeah. OK, it's so true. Like Sure. So that's actually a reasonable objection. Thus far, we've focused on finding holes here. Well, if all of a sudden this guy's purpose in life isn't just to respond to DNS queries, but is instead to look at a TCP IP packet, figure out where the HTTP headers are, look then for a PHP session ID, look it up in that its own hash table or its own database to figure out what box it's destined for, that takes some cycles. Even just saying that took a few moments. So now you all of a sudden seem to have your bottleneck potentially here. And at some point, you are going to have this box being overwhelmed, which means now all you've done is, yes, you've sort of solved the scalability problem here, but you've just kind of forced it up here into just a different level of the problem. What else is problematic about doing this kind of load balancing where you just partition your users on different boxes? Yeah. Same problem, right? This is, this is kind of the easiest thing to pick on because this is one of the goals we're trying to achieve in the first place. If one of these boxes dies, with it goes all of the logged in users, which kind of doesn't defeat the point of all of this, but it certainly defeats one of the points, which is to have redundancy along with this scalability. And other concerns with this particular approach? Yeah. Right, so if we're just taking into account um, the session that we need to maintain, well, what if, again, David is just a much more active user than everyone else? What if those other people have logged into these boxes and maybe even sent randomly the first time to one of these boxes, but thereafter they just left their browser window open and went home for the day? Well, the well, load balancer might still be remembering that oh, I've given uh, David to this box, Joe to this box, Sally to this box, but it's not taking into account the relative load on those systems. There's no communication in this description, in this solution thus far, between these two nodes. It's all being done at this level. And you can't partition the database if there are any cross uh, user transactions. If the customer Argbar debits his and that is to credit customers mm -hmm. uh, Zebra, mm -hmm. then if those are Bark and Zebra on different computers, yeah, I've sort of been assuming that your databases are so simple as th that they can be just put autonomously on a s or in isolation on one system, which Right, that might not be such a reasonable assumption if the database is at all interesting and in that users are somehow tied together or just there needs to be shared state across your application. Yeah? Right, now you've just kind of added complexity at this level when again the whole purpose here is to sort of improve performance, not sort of slow everything down here and then send the users on their way. So this isn't to say this isn't a good solution, but it is to say that there are trade-offs and one needs to sort of decide are the costs lower than the benefits or vice versa in this case. Well let's now pick on the the, uh, the issue that you put your finger on earlier that I said we'd come back to. So sticky sessions is sort of the buzzword when it comes to maintaining sessions in a cluster of systems. So the goal at hand is scalability. That is scaling to handle bigger load, thus making your machine, your service more available so that it's highly available is the buzzword, so that your setup itself is redundant, so that if one box fails, the others can take over. That seems to be a theme if one of the concerns is dead boxes. But if you need to have session stickiness, whereby you remember information about the user, no matter where they are sent within your cluster of systems, how can we implement this? Well, one way is the first question mark. And here I'm getting away with uh, not proposing these as solutions, but possible solutions. Layer 7 load balancing, just to summarize, why is that a potential solution? How does that work? And how does that solve session stickiness, whereby I maintain a user session no matter uh, independent of my sort of, how does this relate to maintaining a user session without forgetting who they are just because of your scalability solution? 
Exactly. It's layer 7 in the networking sense in that the load balancer or that arbit uh, the arbiter in between user and cluster has the ability to do some introspection and figure out where that user should be sent. So you don't have the session across all your boxes. It still lives on one, but one way to maintain a user session, even if you have multiple boxes for scalability, is just somehow ensure that that user goes to the same box again and again and again, which is a somewhat orthogonal goal to scaling in the first place, but it does at least solve that problem. Well, what about the second bullet point? Why might shared storage, whether it's fiber channel, iSCSI, NFS, if you're familiar with the jargon, shared storage in any sense be a possible solution here? Yeah. Yeah, so recall that we've said in this class that with PHP, the default location for session files, which are just text files, which store a serialized version of everything in dollar sign underscore session, live in what directory? Well, slash temp. Well, the nice thing about Unix and Linux boxes is that you can mount file systems on multiple boxes. So why not just say that slash temp on each of your servers actually points to a folder that's on the network? That's not on the local hard drive. And in fact, when uh, one of my courses used to use the FAS web servers, www.fas.harvard.edu, there were actually multiple web servers in that cluster, www1, 2, maybe 3 or more. And we had precisely this problem, whereby we wanted students to be able to log into the course's website. We therefore needed to maintain PHP sessions. And I knew those sessions were going to be stored in slash temp by default. The problem is on most systems, slash temp is a local directory. Well, via your PHP INI, you can tell the session files to go anywhere. Well, in FAS, if you're familiar with the architecture, there's a slash scratch directory, which is a really big folder that everyone can write to, but only, not everyone can read from. So I just told PHP via our config file, put everything in slash scratch slash CS50. And all of those little temp files ended up in slash scratch, which was mounted across all of the web servers um, or across all of the web servers. Now the catch is that it's I'm not I think it was using NFS and so long term if we were trying to support tens of thousands of students we might run into some performance problems with this approach but for the few dozen hits we get per minute or per hour certainly an acceptable solution. So shared storage that is if the problem is that you need to maintain the same view of your data on multiple places just put the data in one place that everyone is talking to. So in terms of this picture Put the database conceptually here, put the session files conceptually here, and then somehow link to those things. And if you've not taken networking courses or have this background, at least for tonight's purposes, assume that you probably work with someone who, if asked nicely, could attach some shared storage to whatever set of web servers your job requires that you put code on. Now here's an interesting solution. So, Thus far, and everyone out there is kind of naked down on cookies for storage of data and tend not to use them for very much. But imagine like an e-commerce site where I really don't want to spend the money for shared storage. I'm also not really a networking guy and therefore I don't have the savvy to go set up what sounds in the book I'm reading to be the ideal setup. Well, can I use sort of my existing skill set similar in spirit to using DNS and those PHP accelerators just with my sort of current knowledge? Well, what can you do with cookies? Well, what kinds of things are stored in a session for something like Amazon.com or any e-commerce site? Your shopping cart. Your shopping cart, right? So the widget you want to buy and the other widget you want to buy are typically <coughs> stored in a session if we're inferring how Amazon works, which is in dollar sign underscore session if they were using PHP. And that data is really then stored on some in some file on one of their servers. But that data exists to sort of benefit me, the user, maintaining this session. And my browser, assuming I haven't been paranoid and turned all this stuff off, has the ability to maintain state on a per website basis. So where else could we store the contents of my shopping cart? You, right, a very leading question here tonight, right? You could just store it in the cookie. And now granted, there is, I believe, an upper bound on, there is an upper bound on how much data you can store in a user's cookie. But if all it takes to remember the contents of a shopping cart is maybe the product number and the quantity, you know, that actually might scale reasonably well. That is to say, just put the burden on the user or his or her browser to just remind you with every request what it is that's in their shopping cart. Now, some of you might be worrying, wait a minute, now the user can tinker with their shopping cart. I mean, these kinds of concerns. And that's true. They can just edit that file. 
or they can you know, go into the contents of their RAM or forge an HTTP request. But is that really problematic? I mean, what's the worst thing they might do? Buy something that they, I mean, buy something you sell, right? I mean, not to make light of it, but you can certainly validate that the product IDs are legitimate, right? So you don't have to sell them something that doesn't exist. And so long as you're not doing something stupid, like storing the price in the cookie, right? That can still be done server side. That's kind of a reasonable solution, right? So long as there's a finite amount of information and it's not that big, why not just let the user remind you of this. There's a gotcha here. Where's the glaring problem? OK, so turn, I'll take the easy one first. So turning off cookies is really bad, because now no one can check out. So there, too, kind of a trade-off. Yeah? So logging on from different machines. Not even that. How about just logging on from one machine? If there's no longer dollar sign underscore session, Right? How do you keep track of the fact that the user is logged in if you only want to show them certain things based on their you know, having authenticated? Well, what could you do? You've been storing tokens, some of you, to remember that a user is logged in on the server side. What if I just gave the user a token and say, remind me of this token the next time you return so that I can then say, oh, yeah, that user is logged in. Would that work? Sorry? So you, might have to, you would have to look up that token, but at least you can look it up in your database, and you don't have to look it up in dollar sign underscore session. And that was, again, the goal, to get rid of the session itself and push more into the browser. But what are the implications of sort of having the user proactively remind you? Well, what is this token going to look like? All right, how about we end on a cliffhanger here and take our five-minute donut break? <laughs> All right, so we're back. The big cliffhanger was cookies, good idea, bad idea. Come up with anything else? Very productive break, yes? OK. So it's not bad. So you do run into this problem of a limit on the amount of data that can be stored. And I think it's browser dependent. So it's one of those things. And it is fairly limited, though I think actually Yahoo um, and or one or, other, one or more other JavaScript frameworks have actually begun pr building libraries that allow you to store an, un an arbitrary amount of data on the browser side, um, I believe by using some various DOM tricks and iframes and those kinds of things. So know that there do exist those kinds of options if you really want to go this route. Cookies being turned off, though, is a pretty compelling um, problem. But depends if you can make certain assumptions about your user base. And this is perhaps a simpler solution than putting things server side, then maybe it does, in fact, work. Yeah? No? OK. Well, how do we do this load balancing in the first place? Right? It's one thing to say, here's a picture of a load balancer. Go implement this solution. But it'd be kind of nice if we could sort of tease apart what it is here that you would go about installing or buying or renting. Well, you have at least two approaches to this problem of load balancing and sort of filling in that box. And now by load balancing, we're not talking about DNS-based solutions, because that you can presumably do with GoDaddy already or your own DNS server. But now we're talking about putting some hardware in your own, um, in your own data center or your own server room whose purpose in life is to take incoming requests and then determine to which IP address or which machine it should then route that information. Well, fortunately, you do have a number of free solutions in this space. So uh, LVS, the Linux virtual server, is a popular choice. There's a couple of others which are even lighter weight, Perbal, uh, Perlball or Bal, I'm not sure. It's meant to imply balance. Pound, Ultra Monkey, which is kind of a funny name, but um, for one of my courses this fall, I think that actually is going to be the solution we use because you can have it, uh, you can roll it out um, in software purely, even in virtual machines, and you can actu it actually supports multiple. Um, load balancers in software running side by side so that you don't have that single point of failure coming in. So at least check it out if you want to go the free route. Arguably much simpler is to just buy something and plug your stuff into it, maybe do a little web-based configuration and leave it at that. And so for this, there exist a number of hardware solutions. One of the less expensive ones that 
is all over the web is Barracuda. If you go with one of their low-end devices, it would run you maybe $1,000, $2,000. And what these are are pretty much big switches that look like hubs or switches with which you're already familiar. And there's at least one WAN port that you plug into your internet connection, and then typically multiple LAN ports into which you plug dub 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 one, dub 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 two, dub 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 three. And then you would typically pull up some kind of configuration program that's probably web-based these days so that you connect to this um, load balancer, aka web switch, and there's some other jargon that floats around, and you just tell the load balancer what rules it should use to decide, given some inbound traffic, which port it should go out on, or specifically which IP address it should get routed to. So it, the types of configuration options you have will vary based on, uh, based on load balancers. Some of them only do IP routing, and you can say, do it pseudo randomly. You can do it at layer seven, so to speak. You can say, look at the HTTP traffic and decide based on these heuristics if the model you bought supports that. Or you can actually buy models that have some form of bi directional or unidirectional communication, whereby in simple form, the load balancer just pings each of the machines every second. And the first time it doesn't hear back from a machine, it assumes it's offline. And even if you've told the load balancer to send a third of your traffic here, it will just immediately cease and ideally email you or page you or send up some flashing red light saying one of your machines seems to have gone offline. Some of the load balancers will have more sophisticated System, uh, setups, heartbeat signals, so to speak, where you can actually have the traffic go the other way, where the purpose of these guys is to actually remind the load balancer every n seconds, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. So this way, when you don't hear that response, the load balancer assumes the machine's gone offline and alerts a human to go deal with the problem. So again, you'll sort of get what you pay for here, and you'll also get more features the more time and uh, effort and complexity you're willing to invest in the problem, but you at least have those options that can operate at a number of different levels, either the purely network level or the application level. If you, start to have, if you need to start dealing with tens of thousands connections per second or even more than that, coming through not just your web servers, but your single point, your load balancer, right? These things, if you're trying to handle 100,000 connections per second and you know that each of your web servers can handle 20,000 per second, well, you get five web servers. Unfortunately, you need a really expensive load balancer that can handle itself 100,000 connections per second, right? So you do have this sort of potential bottleneck there. And so uh, really expensive high performance sites might invest in some of these guys. F5 is a pretty popular one these days, but you start looking at $20,000 or $50,000 just for your load balancer. And they work really well. And according to their specs, they'll handle upwards of 120,000 connections per second was the model that I looked at recently in F5 when poking around their website. Granted, you know it's going to cost a lot when you pull up their website and they don't show you what. Prices, right? Any site that says, you know, call us for quote, you, know, it, you gotta get a little nervous. But there's really interesting features that some of these guys provide, like HTTPS, which in a classroom we often wave our hands at and say it's computationally more expensive, right? And this is why a lot of sites avoid it. Well, when you have to start thinking about load balancing, you now need to start thinking about potentially dealing with HTTPS connections. And when you're talking about a thousand connections, ten thousand connections per second. Well, when each, if those are HTTP transactions and somehow HTTPS, sorry, if those are HTTPS connections and somehow crypto has to be involved, even if that only increases your computational cost by 20% or 50%, multiply that now by 10,000 uh, 10, or 20,000 and now those kinds of numbers start to add up. And it, this is why the biggest sites out there really have to give some careful thought as to whether is it worth it for me to run HTTPS for everything or just fall back on HTTP. And some of the more expensive equipment is sort of optimized in hardware to handle HTTPS connections so that, the, they can, so that these boxes can sit effectively as a man in the middle and still handle HTTP traffic, which is otherwise encrypted and thus obscures interesting information inside of it that might be useful for load balancing. So if you're just working in an environment where 50K for a box, probably not so feasible or necessary given your user base, some of these software solutions, in particular LVS and UltraMonkey, um, seem to be pretty popular and a good community exists for those. Yeah? 
Oh, so it's a good question. It's certainly in vogue these days. And I mean, to be honest, I've sort of grown up in the era of the internet when it comes to this stuff. But I imagine there are a uh, applications from the telco industry from yesteryear where you have batch to handle mainframes. batch mainframes kind of doing. Big, big thing about load balancing. So you see, I'm dating myself by answering in this way. Um, so yeah, I can't imagine these are new principles there, but I can't speak well to the history. Even going back to your original example of needing to call to different phone numbers, mm. there were hardware switches that if, if line 5500 was busy, it would immediately switch you to line 5501. Yeah, that's true. I forgot my own example. I remember growing up, some friends of mine, they had three kids and thus lots of phone calls. And so they had this neat technology at the time with whatever, uh, Bell South or whomever, that they tied two phone lines together. So they only told the world about one number, but both of them would, one or the other would ring. So. Yes is the answer to your question, according to my middle school friend's experience. So any questions now on load balancing? Yeah? If, what if you're in an HTTP request that's handled by, I'm thinking more of the hardware thing, and you start something with streaming that's not HTTP, that's linked? Yes. So. Oh, good question. So what about other protocols? So it depends. Um, different protocols and thus ports are supported by different types of software and hardware. So the short answer, it depends. And I don't know these particular brands well enough to speak to, um, say, some of the more specialized application like streaming, which have their own um, tough problems related. Server at the head of the chain, right, meaning the chain. So like, like these guys? One, two, three, maybe one is clogged. Yes, yes. So, yes. So there are both. I, don't, I can't point my finger accurately off the cuff as to which provide precisely that feature. But yes, absolutely. Like, there, are exist, there are both software and hardware solutions that have either unidirectional or bidirectional communication with the endpoint so that they can take load into actual account. Even by doing something simple like running the equivalent of top on the Linux box, looking at the load level, and then using that as an input to the load balancing problem. So realize, too, that by design, many of tonight's slides, if nothing else, have been sort of high level and about sort of pointing you in the direction of solutions only because um, many of you are presumably coming in environments that are not just Linux, Apache, MySQL, and the like. And these ideas sort of certainly apply in other contexts as well. So hopefully, if nothing else, if this is a problem you have to tackle, at least tonight's sort of conceptual coverage of this can get you started and point you in the direction of something that is worthwhile your researching. I think we'd be a little boring if we focused, for instance, on the nuances of binds configuration files or just one of these options. But know that. Um, uh, certainly turn to the bulletin board if you have want to share in conversations about such. So what about a different approach to this problem altogether, right? So one solution to this problem of scaling is you can throw more hardware at it, either vertically or horizontally. But what if we sort of rethink our application and maybe, maybe not worry so much about is this the most tightest for loop I can write, but sort of think about what the bottlenecks are in my application. Well, typically, you sh well, you should know already that memory, RAM, is faster than disk. So the more you can avoid disk, the faster, in theory, your application should be. Uh, queries from RAM or cache tend to be much faster than queries of databases, if only because databases, if they're large, exist on disk. And there's computational costs of databases, right? Parsing your SQL expression, especially if it's fairly long and complicated and your table is large, there's a computational cost there. So imagine a website, say uh, Craigslist, that yes, allows people to provide input, and there are thus writes to a database, but which is probably more common, writes or reads, and something like Craigslist's uh, want ads or apartment listings. I mean, probably reads, which is a pretty reasonable assumption for a lot of websites out there, right? Slashdot, it, update, it gets updated pretty frequently, but by a couple of people, maybe a couple times per hour. The rest of the time, its cycles are spent on reads. So it seems kind of stupid to generate, say, each of the uh, for sale ads or the apartment for rent ads on Craigslist by a select star from apartments where uh, apartment ID or where city equals quote unquote Cambridge. Every time someone does a search for available apartments in Cambridge, because is the data going to change between now and one minute from now? 
Probably not. Is the data going to change between now and five minutes from now? Mm, probably not. There's going to come a, a threshold there. But if we're talking thousands or hundreds of connections per second, well, that's a lot of database queries, even if the thing's getting updated as frequently as one minute apart. Right? That's thousands of unnecessary selects if you so much as remember the answer to the first query. So caching is a wonderfully useful solution that sort of underlies all of today's hardware. L1 cache, L2 cache, sometimes L3 cache. The whole point of all of this, RAM itself, is to avoid touching slower mechanisms like disk or even RAM with respect to cache. So how can you go about caching your dynamic website's output and thus avoid some of the more expensive computational tasks like asking your database for anything? Well, what does Craigslist do if you've used it recently? Yeah. Yeah. So Craigslist, if you look at the URLs of a typical want ad, will simply lead you to, and it's going to be really small here, but you can validate this at home by clicking some links. It goes to an .html file, and it looks like it's sort of pseudo randomly named 640115688.html. But the presumption here is probably that the Craigslist folks assume that this post, once posted, is never going to change. And even if it is, OK, then they'll incur the expense of deleting this file and creating a new one or some equivalent task. But thereafter, once this ad is posted, and I see you're all reading the ad. It really doesn't matter what it says. But it is germane because it's from Cambridge. And actually, it's a job offer. So if uh, you're interested, check this out. Um, I chose it intentionally for that reason. But if, the, if you want to optimize for reads, well, we live in a world now where web servers are really, really, really good and fast at doing what? Serving out static content. Like, we've been good at this for the past 10, 12, 15 years since the, web, since, you know, the first web servers were designed. So things like Apache or alternatives like Light HTTPD, which is a free web server whose purpose in life is to be fast and very lightweight. Web servers are really good at spitting out static files. All they have to do is grab the file from the disk and just pass through the bytes to the browser. No computation really involved beyond, uh, beyond what's necessary to achieve that. There's no processing. There's no compiling. There's nothing. So Craigslist made a, um, a design decision a while ago, I think, to just store their content as .html files. And if you've ever posted an ad to Craigslist, what are you told after you hit submit and then confirm it? Anyone posted to Craigslist? OK, you're told if you post to Craigslist like for something for sale, your post should appear within five to 10 minutes, which for some websites is kind of annoying or kind of unreasonable. But for Craigslist, it's presumably a performance decision. You, you don't need to see the post you just made, especially if they can generate a preview. The whole world doesn't need to see it right now. Five minutes isn't going to kill the resale value of whatever it is you're selling or the job offer you're posting. So they presumably have a cron job or something equivalent that once in a while goes through a database, does a select star where last modified time is greater than five minutes ago or whatever, generates a whole bunch of web pages, and then never touches the database again for reads. Unless I decide, ooh, typo, I need to fix something, then their database gets updated. So they avoid touching the more expensive piece of their puzzle, which is, in their case, presumably their database, and which is, generally speaking, a bottleneck vis-a-vis -vis just a static file. So downsides of this? Yeah. Uh, Slower to update so that you don't see immediate results, which is probably not so good for like a bank website where you'd kind of like to see your current balance. You can think of other examples probably. Uh, it takes a lot of storage. Takes a lot of storage. But in addition to your data and your PHP or whatever, you need to store the results of it. Yeah, so that's true. We, so we live in a world of very verbose XHTML markup, though you know, maybe CSS is trying to help with that. But you're storing you know, outputs that you wouldn't otherwise be storing out, uh, storing metadata, like the HTML tag. So trade-off there, maybe acceptable, but a trade-off. Yeah? No per-user customization at all. So there's no per-user customization. So yeah, that's true about Craigslist. The pages do not vary, largely because I don't think there's a login mechanism. They, the pages don't vary based on user. You all see the same content because you really can't. If you're giving up the dynamic and here's maybe a semantic argument. Is this a dynamic website? Well, it's kind of a dynamically generated static website, but who really cares what you call it at the end of the day? But that's an interesting catch. There's really no 
dynamism across users or on a per page basis. You sort of, everyone gets the same thing. Yes, seconded. <laughs> Mm -hmm. On the other hand, Windows at least has a limit of 255 characters for the full path name. Yeah, so that's an interesting gotcha too. As soon as you start using your file system, you've got new limitations, like the length of the file yeah. names, the naming scheme for the files, the number of files in a given directory. So it might not be a deal breaker, but it's certainly something you need to take into account. And it looks like it presumably Craigslist doesn't really run into a scalability problem because these URLs don't look particularly long and they're using pretty long numbers, it seems. But, you know, it depends on the file system that they're using as to how many files can actually be stored in there. So, an interesting trade-off as well. All right, well, what about other approaches? This is pretty simple. And to be clear, with any of your PHP projects thus far, odds are you could have used um, PHP's, uh, what's the function called? OB, output buffer. I forget the word. The, there's a function that allows you to turn off output, that allows you to turn on output buffering which means that rather than content in your PHP files getting spit out automatically, gets put into an internal memory buffer. And there's another function in PHP, whose name I also forget, but I've used before, that will allow you to take everything that you just generated with this PHP file, tuck it into a string, a variable rather, so that you can then write that string to a file. And I'll post these to the bulletin board because I forget what they are, but we use them actually. Um, just to make this more real, we use Ajax to update the front of the website. And what was the reason here? Um, oh, that's what it was. OK, so the right-hand side of the page are, is the mention of the upcoming office hour. So this is a dynamic website in that that data comes from Google Calendar. So you've seen this now, presumably. So I didn't want to, we didn't want to have to store both data for the right-hand side of the page and the Google Calendar. So the data that appears on the right-hand side of the page, if your resolution is apparently big enough, should fix that. Um, th that data is coming from here. Unfortunately, querying Google's API is a little slow. And so I was getting really annoyed when I first implemented this that this side of the page was taking like two, three seconds to display. And by that point, most users had already clicked a link to get somewhere. So what we actually do is make this query once, cache the results in an HTML file so that the next time you visit the page, you're seeing slightly stale data, but within three seconds, it then updates itself. And the idea is that we're amortizing the cost of a query to Google over multiple users, the idea being that, well, if a bunch of you are checking the website at once, n minus one of you will benefit from the first guy having seen slightly stale data. And we do this just by storing information in a text file. And actually, the easiest way to remember these function names offhand would be to just pull up that file, which is right in our Ajax folder in fyi.php. So this is pretty basic PHP, and I'm going to skip over this. Oh, it's ob start turns on output buffering, which means normally anything down here, like this div tag, would just get spit out to the browser. Calling ob start says, don't spit it out. Tuck everything away into RAM until I'm ready for it. Because then down here, after we've done some manipulation of the data, notice I'm calling the other function whose name I promised, ob get contents which gets the contents of everything that's been buffered in RAM for you by PHP, tucks it in a variable called XHTML. This is just a little wrapper I wrote, which this function called cache stores this string in a file called FYI.HTML. Just sort of take for granted that that's what that function does. Then I call OB end clean, which just turns off output buffering. And then I go ahead and print out the buffer as XML for use in this Ajax call. So in short, this sort of interesting lesson here is my having started output buffering, grab the contents when I'm ready, caching the contents, and then emptying the buffer, or rather saying uh, empty the buffer, because it's still in the string, spit out the string. So I'm sort of circumventing what PHP is supposed to be doing for me. But the upside now is that in the course's website, which I believe is Let's see if I can find it here. So this is the template that we use for the course's website to generate half of the web page. And 
what I do here is rather than execute an AJAX call when a st student visits the page, I check my cache, and this is again a function I wrote that looks for the file called fyi.html, and because I'm echoing it, dumps the contents of that file. And to prove as much, I think our cache is in here. I have a few different caches because I've sort of implemented this myself, that we'll see an off the shelf solution in a moment. In fyi.htm, this is just the XHTML that was dynamically generated by that script. And I did this to avoid the latency that students would otherwise see because of the slowness of Google's API. But for performance reasons, if we weren't updating this in the first place every few seconds or every minute, that's really all it takes to take this approach of caching the files. Now granted, there is a, a gotcha here, which is that I'm using a scripting language to get these files and I'm not using the web server. So there's actually a bit of inefficiency here, unlike Craig's list, which is just letting the web server spit out the files. But if I wanted to, I could certainly play some games with URLs and achieve that same idea. But because I'm embedding just a part of the XHTML and not a whole page, I sort of had to engineer a, a little more um, expensive solution using PHP. Well, what about this? Well, I mean, uh, the best solutions, perhaps, at least on your first pass for performance, is if you can just turn on a switch. Turns on, here's a switch you can turn. Turns out, here's a switch you can turn on. So query cache type equals 1 will tell MySQL, in most environments, to start uh, using its MySQL query cache. So what MySQL can actually do for you out of the box is uh, cache the answers to frequently asked questions, so to speak. And it does this by remembering that if you execute the query, select star from foo, MySQL query, uh, or sorry, MySQL, the database, will remember that the user has once upon a time executed select star from foo. The next time I make that same MySQL query, if this thing is on, what it should do, assuming the cache hasn't gone stale, is return the results of the previous query without even looking through the database tables, which is a good thing if those tables are really, really big. And maybe a better example is saying select star from foo where ID equals 1, 2, 3, right? where I only wanted a specific row and thus don't want to search through the whole darn database yet again. MySQL can just cache the results of that query for you and then return the results from its cache as opposed to iterating over its database table. Yes? Yes, so you can specify a timeout, but what MySQL is good at is at detecting when the data changes. So the moment that row gets touched and thus, or the moment that row gets changed by an update or some other modification of the table, it will flush the relevant entry from the cache. Oh, so you don't even really need that, but... It should do it for you. Wow. So this is one of these easy things to do, at least in most MySQL environments, because the database can sort of do this for you already. Now, in small installations of MySQL, you might not notice a difference. Frankly, if we don't have this on on our setup, and I think even if we did, you wouldn't notice a difference, because most of us, even the course, is only using tables with a few hundred rows for students and such. But for larger installations, this is one of these pieces of low-hanging fruit. Now, a more sophisticated solution that actually has gotten a lot of press, because supposedly sites like Facebook and a few other popular websites have apparently been using this or variants thereof is memcached. So this is a service that you can run on, say, a Linux box, and you can download it, install it, run it. And what it does is serve as a cache for you, for anything, really. You can tuck away objects and strings and whatnot into it so that you don't have to compile that same information again as from a database. So this um, memcached has an API for multiple languages. I went ahead and looked at the PHP version of it, which actually, in the spirit of the kitchen sink, comes with PHP. So if you go to this last URL, you'll see this suite of functions. And provided you've turned it on on your web server, and I don't think we have currently, but I'll take a look at the config, you can begin doing things like this. And the setup to this, this story is it's pretty expensive to query your database again and again and again, especially if the information is not changing. But you don't want to do the whole .html thing for whatever reason. It doesn't work well for you. It's not, you don't want to worry about URLs being statically defined. But you kind of want to avoid your database. You'd rather tuck things away in memory or even on disk because tucking it in a known location on disk is better than having it be somewhere on disk in a database table. So in the world of PHP, we can connect 
to the host on which the memcached daemon is running on a specific port. And these can be on the local host if you've just followed default instructions for installing the thing on your server. Suppose now that the context is I want to get the user object. So I've done my application involved use users, maybe a user class, and there's a lot of data in there. The first name, last name, phone number, email address, a lot of stuff, a whole row from a table. And I don't want to have to go search the table again and again for data that's rarely going to change because users tend not to change their name or phone number every time they visit a site. So first I'm going to check the cache. So memcache get is going to query my cache. Think of it as a big hash table implemented as a black box so far as you're concerned. I'm going to check the memcache for a certain ID, which I've not defined here, but assume it's 1234 or whatever. If the user is null, that is the, the implication being what? It wasn't in the cache. Maybe it expired. Maybe it wasn't there in the first place. Now I'm going to have to incur that expense. But I'm going to save the fruits of my labors in that cache later. So I'm going to connect to my database. I'm going to select my database. And I've used all caps for uh, constants that really are uninteresting for our purposes. Then I'm going to call MySQL query, selecting star from users, where ID equals 1234. Now I'm going to use MySQL fetch object, which if you haven't used before, takes a whole row from a table and reads it into an object of type equivalent to what the class is that you specify. So that is to say, if I've got a class called user that has a whole bunch of fields that I've defined in user.php, this will read that row from a result into a user object, as opposed to an associative array or as opposed to a standard class object, which is the generic one in, in PHP. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes and no. So in short, and let me defer discussion of the OOP features of PHP till later, this function really creates a generic object, fills it with properties that are equal to the fields from that row. But if you specify the class, what you also get automatically then is access to the methods that are defined for that class. So that's what you really get. So you don't have to define in advance all of the member variables for a class. This function will create them as properties of that PHP object. But it's the member function, the, me the methods, that's useful about defining a user class. So in short, if you're not quite clear on the OOP stuff and your background on object-oriented programming not so strong, assume for tonight that this just returns a big object in memory that represents a user. And ideally, you'd like to avoid asking for that object again from your database because it's expensive to get the information. So before I you know, go through this expensive process again, let me do myself a favor, pay up, pay up front a computational cost by storing it in my memcache, so calling memsat, memset, memcache set, passing in the reference to the thing, and then set, using this as my key, so saying, next time I ask for ID, give me back this object. So it's, again, like a hash table or um, hash map in Java, those kinds of things. And then sort of the story ends here. Because at this point in the story, I've got my user object. I've tucked it away. So the next time I ask for the user object, in theory, it should come back even faster, assuming it's my database stuff that's, that's kind of slow. Yeah? Indeed. Exactly. I mean, simplicity is a compelling feature unto itself. And sim the simplest way to have shared data across multiple web servers, if you're trying to go down this road of scalability, you just put one, maybe expensive, but one big database. But you can do some intelligent application layer things to sort of keep the connections between these web servers and that database um, free from gratuitous communication. You can free up some cycles by just asking for fewer pieces of data from the database. And you can do that by using caches here. And the nice thing here, too, is if you're using something like memcached, even if you're running it on each of the boxes, and even because of load balancing, the user on each request might get sent to a random box, well, what's the implication for your cache? Yeah, so maybe you'll have a cache mix. So suppose the user ends up here first. You get the user object, tuck it away in this guy's cache. Maybe a few seconds later, he ends up on this box. Eh, you have a cache miss, but it's not going to break your application. It's not going to be as fast as you might like. It's still going to have to ask the database again, but at least now the data is going to be cached on this box. 
probabilistically you'll end up back on this guy eventually and this guy and again you have to worry about timeout issues and the like and if you change something in the database you've got to expire this cache but you can do that at the application layer for instance if you've got a page in your website that is the preferences page whereby a user can change his or her modification data well you just have to somehow expire these caches which might not be the simplest thing but at least if you set the timeouts to be low like expire within 10 seconds you can at least tell the user or you know you can kind of um, tolerate uh, very temporal inconsistencies in your data until the cache expires and for the user who's up well I don't want to start making arguments along these lines so there are implications of this but what you get is potential simplicity by just having one database and certainly higher performance by not having to talk to that database as much. Can you share the memcache So it's a good question. Can you share memcache uh, D's data across servers? So in theory, yes. But I think the, the goal of memcache is to keep as much as possible in RAM, which means that doesn't quite fly. And as soon as you start having shared storage, it starts to devolve back into the problem you're trying to avoid. Maybe not as bad, because it's just disk instead of a database. Um, so I think in short, you could do that, but it has problematic implications for RAM. Yeah. Good question. How long does it stay around? You can actually set as uh, optional arguments to memcache set the expiry time. So there is a default, I think. I don't know what it is offhand. But you can specify it in seconds or whatnot. So, so good question. So if you change the database, what are the implications for the cache? If you are, a are able to get by by just expiring it on one box, if you can assume the user is going to end up back on the same box, yes, you can just expire the cache, make the database change. The catch is that if the user might the next time get sent to another box, now you've got some data consistency issues, which you can kind of probabilistically mitigate by making the expiration pretty short in terms of seconds, but the user might still see some stale data. Or then you can start, you can, or you can assume you have a load balancing solution that takes session into account, so the user is going to keep coming back to this box at least as long as the session, it, the box is alive. But again, then other questions arise. And that's sort of tonight's theme, right? It, once you sort of plug this hole, some other leak springs up potentially elsewhere. But the, the hard part, or the useful takeaway, hopefully, is you know, what are these leaks and what are the, the trade offs of dealing with them? OK, so the last focus for tonight is on MySQL itself. So we sort of began by looking at PHP. Then we took a step back and looked at things related to networks. Then we dove back into our own application and sort of challenged ourselves: how can we do this more intelligently? And related to that is the design of your database. And we've made mention of the fact that there are different storage engines for MySQL. We've said if you need transactions, you need to use in ODB instead of my ISAM. Um, but that's sort of all that we've said on that. But there's actually some performance implications of not only your database table design, which you can spend an entire semester or half semester talking about normalization and sort of low level performance techniques and query optimization, but there's some sort of low hanging fruit here in terms of picking your table types. Um, in a manner consistent with your performance goals. So this is a picture taken from my, actually no, from one of our recommended texts that just kind of paints the picture as follows. So you have at the top of this picture connection management security. So this is like the PHP library, like MySQL Connect, MySQL Query, that provides you with an interface to your tables. Um, SQL parsing, execution, caching, this is sort of what MySQL itself does. It's MySQL itself that parses your query, that tries to find that data for you. But MySQL itself is sort of providing a layer of abstraction to the actual pieces of memory on disk or RAM that are actually storing your data. So this is only to say there are these layers involved in simple things like MySQL query. And there's some interesting opportunities for op um, optimization here. So my ISAM is the default engine. It's the one that you sort of get by default when you define a table type. And it tends to be fairly high performing. It's fast. It's been around a long time. But it doesn't support things like transactions. Uh, it does support, though, not transactions per se, but what? And this locks, but table locks, which is to say you can avoid pro race conditions and the like by saying only one thread can write to the table the table at once. 
This is a problem if you want to service tens of thousands of connections per second. If each of those guys needs to lock the whole table, that means you've got a line of 900 and what, uh, 9,999 people sort of queuing up behind him. Not so good if you're trying to maximize your throughput here. So InnoDB, by contrast, supports transaction in as much as it supports row level locking, where you only lock one row at a time. And so long as multiple threads are probabilistically trying to touch different rows, that's a really big gain. Now, if they're all trying to update the same user, uh, problem, again. But the odds of that happening in a typical application are probably pretty low. So um, heap. This is a useful one, especially for temporary tables. So the heap type, aka memory type, is a MySQL table that is by design supposed to exist purely in RAM. So this is useful if you have some read-only data, or a cache, if you will, that you yourself want to be able to query really quickly. And it doesn't have to be terribly large, because there is a bound on the number of megs or gigs that you can put in a heap table. But this is meant um, not to store data permanently, but just during runtime, because the contents of these tables are lost if you reboot the server or restart MySQL. But that's by design. NDB, by contrast, is a distributed um, storage engine. So when you get to the point of needing not multiple web servers only, but multiple database servers, this is a file system that allows you, in a nutshell, to have multiple SQL servers one of which can die, it can explode, the other two of which have enough information about the world so that you don't lose any data, and the rest of the cluster can continue to operate. For that to work, you need some intelligence at this level of the puzzle, and NDB provides exactly that. So it's for, um, and rather than walk through all of these details, know that this is taken from MySQL's website for version 5.0, I think. Yeah, so it's applicable actually for any of them because it's storage engine based. But this is just a chart that paints a picture of the different features offered by these various storage engines from left to right. So just to give you a sense, transactions is one of the first ones. And notice that only InnoDB and NDB support that. So you can't do it within memory tables or MyISAM. Um, foreign key constraints. So we've, I think some of the TFs have discussed these in sections, but you ha if you have a primary key in one table and you want to sort of ensure that that table, that key can exist in another table, but you don't want one to get deleted without the other getting deleted, you can define what are called foreign key constraints, but only if you use InnoDB. So that's an implication. And again, here are the costs, right? For a lot of reads, for instance, my ISAM tends to be very popular. Um, very high performing, but it comes at a price whereby you can't define these kinds of constraints. You can't have row level locking, so you pay that price in another sense. Um, full text indexes. So my ISAM is really good if you want to empower users to search for keywords in entire Craigslist posts, for instance. You can't do that within ODB, um, at least as quickly, looking for substring matches. Um, Let's look at another. You can look at the relative disk use and memory use, to which I defer to the online documentation as to why some things are high and low. Because for large databases, it actually has um, some uh, scary implications, perhaps. But I'll leave it at that for now. But certainly, the MySQL documentation um, elaborates on each of these. To let this paint a scary picture, for most applications of MySQL in fairly limited deployments, your choices are my ISAM or InnoDB. And if you want to get a little clever, you can whip out the, the memory or the heap tables if you want to implement your own kinds of fast lookup tables. NDB, as we'll conclude on tonight, involves a, a bit more trickery uh, to get going. And it's also somewhat newer. So the one, one of the biggest pieces of the puzzle we haven't even touched on now is having one big database, expensive and as fast as it may be, is wonderful, except if What's the dot, dot, dot? It goes down, right? Single points of failure, generally, are orthogonal to the whole idea of scalability. Because your application's not going anywhere if a big piece of it is just broken. And so if you have one database, even if it can keep up with all the queries, it doesn't matter how many users your other hardware can support if they're useless without the database. So the question at hand now is, how can we, one, uh, ultimately provide high availability? So provide the data even in the event of a failure of one database. But more than that, if um, we need to do a lot of reads, especially for popular websites, whether it's Facebook or Craigslist or others, well, maybe it's OK to write to one database so that we have one sort of consolidated view of the world, a sort of definitive definition of what the website should look like. But if we have a lot of reads, 
well, maybe a nice solution would be to just make multiple copies of this data and then take that same load balancing solution from earlier tonight, sort of flip it on its head and have multiple, have load balancing among database servers as well. So one of the nice features that MySQL provides, and this isn't something that we really get into in the course because it kind of works best when you have your own set of servers in front of you and not just one uh, remotely accessible. But MySQL is really good at replication, whereby if you set up the configuration files appropriately and you own, say, four computers, all of which are connected via a switch of some sort in your data center or server room, you can configure one of those boxes to be a master. And via its configuration files, you can tell it on some schedule effectively to make sure that anytime something gets updated in the master with an update or an insert, or delete, or create, or drop, et cetera, propagate those changes to the slaves. So now, even though you might want your application, like Craigslist, to write to the single point of failure, at least you can spread the requests and thus improve the speed of your application by load balancing across these guys, which are effectively read-only copies. So can we do better than this? Yeah. So MySQL actually supports what's called master-master replication. And this takes a bite out of that. Um, and the downtime problem, where you can have two masters, whereby you can actually load balance among the two. So you can have some box up there or some software hardware solution that tells all your web servers to talk to maybe this guy or maybe this guy. But you configure those servers by way of MySQL's config files to make sure that any changes made to one get propagated pretty quickly over a network connection to number two and vice versa. So you do have a slight delay potentially in the world, but so long as you have, say, gigabit connections between one and two and your numbers of hits per second sort of allow these, this synchronization to happen, then what you have is not only the opportunity for um, load balancing among the slaves, you can also load balance among the masters as well. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's a really valid point. I mean, it's not without its cost, presumably, since having two locations means logistical costs and financial costs. But yeah, absolutely. Like, you can be as redundant as you want, but if the problem at the end of the day is with the data center or the fire or the electrical connectivity to the building, I mean, it doesn't matter what your own setup looks like. And when you do that, if they have to go through two firewalls, mm -hmm. then that slows things down, too. I mean, well, Right. Well, and so what I, the, the flip side to all of this is that just as replication works within a LAN like this, MySQL can actually replicate itself geographically across clusters. So you can configure it to have even sort of a, a passive site on some other colo facility. Maybe you're paying less for it because you don't have as much bandwidth over there. But at least you can throw a switch if you've sort of created enough layer of abstraction whereby if there's a disaster in your local colo facility, your machine room, you can at least start routing traffic to the other site, which at least with high probability has an almost up-to-date copy of all of the data, though certainly you might lose some of it depending on circumstances. So how can we tie all these things together? Well, things start to get a little complicated, at least pictorially, but conceptually all we're doing is taking all of these ideas, which sort of in a vacuum seem nice, and sort of adding them together. And even though it's adding some management complexity and certainly cost, look at how many machines we've turned this into, it all sort of, at each level of the picture, have we sort of addressed a different problem. So out there we have the client network, the internet. We've got a load balancer. Now I'll disclaim that that itself could be a single point of failure. So now you get into maybe I need two load balancers. So there's, it's not a perfect solution necessarily. But now we have our web servers here. The implication of all these lines is that Write queries should just go to this really expensive box over here, or at least the box with bigger disks and more RAM and faster CPUs. Um, but reads from the same web servers should actually go on these darker lines. And that's pretty easy to achieve. You just make sure that your update.php file connects to this database, but your other queries for selects and the like get routed to this load balancer. And by that, I mean you can do this too with DNS. You can have the requests, because this is your internal network now and you can control TTLs, you can say all of these guys should connect to uh, 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 db.local domain. 
And then this load balancer could just be a DNS server that's routing the request to one of these guys, or it can be one of the more sophisticated solutions we talked about. But we can also now do some replication, where if this is the um, MySQL master, we can actually have him replicating to these database servers so that these read queries are coming into this load balancer and then going out to maybe the uh, least trafficked uh, MySQL server. Well, what about partitioning? That was one buzzword I tossed out earlier, which for some applications might be perfectly reasonable, especially if the simplicity of just saying half of you are going this way and half of you are going that way outweigh the costs of, um, or is much more compelling than any other solution. Well, same idea. We could say that all of the traffic for users A through M are destined for these servers. All of the traffic through N through Z are destined for these servers. And now in this read-only environment, that kind of feels a little more reasonable. right? All the writes can still end up here. But for reads, eh, it's kind of easy if I can just send A through M to these servers and N through Z to these servers. And in the event something breaks, well, then hopefully I've configured something higher that's not pictured in this picture. I can just reroute A through Z to at least half of my network at once. And again, I'm waving my hands a little bit here because it really will depend on the uh, implementation specifics here. But it's sort of the ideas or the trade-offs that we're hoping to convey. Um, this also paints this picture of master, master replication. The, just to be more clear as to what the purpose of something like this might be, plop a load balancer in front of these guys. And now you have two servers that can, in theory, handle twice as much work as one of them. But because of the connection in between them, say some gigabit connection, can they keep themselves synchronized? And you can actually paint more complicated pictures with triangles and multiple SQL tables, uh, multiple databases um, still. But that's perhaps the simplest one that represents all of that. And then finally, for tonight's purposes at least, there's this other solution from the folks at MySQL, which uses NDB, which we alluded to earlier, which is sort of the extension of these ideas to provide high availability and built-in redundancy, similar in spirit to something like RAID 5, whereby you can lose a disk and everything else keeps on ticking until you plug in a new disk to sort of bring yourself back up to a redundant level. Well, this idea of MySQL cluster, whose specifics I won't go into, sort of implements ultimately the same idea, whereby one of your machines can explode or just generally go offline, but you have effectively n plus 1 servers in the picture, so the other n can continue to function without impacting uh, the uh, quality of your results. But you better get that particular node back online or replace it with a new box if you actually want to bring yourself back up to a, a safe level of redundancy. But I'll defer to the online MySQL documentation for specifics of that, since it's the most complicated of the solutions. Whew. Any questions? Yeah. At what point would the um, performance needs make you go to a commercial SQL system? Oh, so that's a really good question. Um, I'm not as familiar with the commercial grade SQL, the stuff you can pay for. My understanding is that what you're uh, large, what you're often paying for, at least with MySQL, is more of the support contract as opposed to the, uh, the server itself. There is a carrier grade MySQL cluster server, which I just started reading about recently, which apparently has features beyond what MySQL cluster itself offers. But by carrier, they mean carrier, like telcos, logging, phone calls, and these kinds of things. Um, and as to the number of hits per second and such, it rather depends on what the machines are and you know, how much RAM you have, the disk, how many queries you're hitting it with per second, um, and so forth. So, but between versions of the software, I mean, I suspect a lot of these big websites, even Facebook, certainly early on, they were taking off-the-shelf solutions and memcached and maybe adding their own modifications, but generally scaling with um, some open source stuff. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, then I have tens of thousands of servers, I'm sure. But the, the price point for you know, lower end hardware is much nicer than the higher end stuff. And if you can get you know, three machines for the price of one and your architecture is designed in a way that allows you to just plug in more and more boxes, I mean, it's a wonderful approach. Yeah? Um, a lot of the enterprise sites use uh, Akamai. Mm -hmm. do, uh, I don't know, There's do static content, content. yeah. I believe so. So the last time I looked into Akamai's offering specifically, they're all, they're all about or mostly about distribution of static content. And I think they do this largely via DNS tricks. Uh, 
or redirection of some sort so that you get a different Akamai server based on your geography, which means their processing takes into account someone's IP and presumed um, uh, location in the world. But that's really, to my knowledge, their main, their bread and butter is about distributing static content, like big images and file streaming and movies and the like. So less about dynamism. So as a result, they don't have to worry so much about sessions and these kinds of things. If, if you were a Hotels.com or Ticketron or something and you wanted to uh, cache query mm -hmm. for performance, can you, is it ethical to show a, a, a seat as available when it's not? I, I think. I mean, you re-perform both. Oh, I see. So if, so if you have an application that demands that the data be 100% up to date, you can use caching, but you have to make sure that you're expiring caches that are no longer valid. So uh, is it ethical? No, probably not. Well, <laughs> I don't know about ethical, but you know, certainly I'm sure some applications can cut corners because what's the cost? I click on that seat and I'm told, oh, it's no longer available. I don't even know why it's no longer available. Maybe someone else just clicks sooner. So there, too, a trade-off. But um, yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, no, I've certainly seen that as well. It's, it's clearly caching there at some point. Uh, well, hopefully I can get away with the, the following conclusion. So if you walk out of here tonight sort of being unclear as to what the right solution is, then I think we've actually, and maybe we're cheating here, and then I think we've actually done our job. So that it's really all about tonight sort of the questions and the trade-offs and the design opportunities, because I don't think there's really one right solution that you should exit here planning on executing. So with that said, we'll see you next week for CSS.